New lessons finished! The new lessons are finished. Chris and I worked together for many long hours to get them finished before the end of this month. The new lessons are called flow English lessons. Flow, of course, describes the movement of water. And water, of course, moves easily and effortlessly. We want you to speak English easily and effortlessly. The new Flow English lessons focus on the most common idioms, vocabulary, and grammar in English. You learn these very deeply. In some ways, they are easier than the Effortless English Club lessons. However, I recommend the new Flow English lessons for everyone who needs to speak faster, better, and automatically. Another great thing about the new lessons, they are good for adults and older children. I think the lessons would be fantastic for high school or even middle school students. Of course, all of our lessons are made for adults. But these lessons have a lot of funny and strange stories, which would also be entertaining to high school and middle school students. A couple of days ago, I announced the new lessons to my email newsletter subscribers. They got a very big discount, but only for one day. It was amazing. So many people got the lessons in just 24 hours. Today, we are sending an announcement to all subscribers to my seven rules email course. If you subscribe to that course, you get the new lessons at a discount also. After three days, we raise the price again, so check your email soon. Next week, I will officially announce the new lessons here on my podcast and blog. I'll include a link to the Flow English page so you can get the new lessons immediately. We're very excited about the new lessons. They fit perfectly with the Effortless English Club lessons. In a month or two, we hope to have our next album ready, the album everyone has been asking about, The Movie Lessons. New Year Resolution. It's time. A new year's beginning, and it's time to make a serious commitment. This is the year you will master English. This is the year you finally speak fluent English. In the U.S., we have the tradition of making New Year's resolutions. A resolution is a strong decision to do something or accomplish something. Unfortunately, most people forget their resolutions. They quickly become distracted and lose their commitment. So, I want you to make your resolution with great emotional power. I want you to say strongly, with tremendous emotion and energy, This year, I will speak English fluently. Say it loud, with a very strong voice. Then do it again. Use all of your body when you say this resolution. Move your arms powerfully. Stand firm. Take a deep breath. And with a loud, powerful voice, say again, This year, I will speak English fluently. As you say this, imagine yourself speaking fluent English. See yourself speaking to a native speaker. Imagine the words coming out of your mouth effortlessly. See yourself smiling and laughing as you talk. You are now a fluent speaker of English. With this image in your mind, yell again, This year, I will speak English fluently. Finally, to make this resolution real, take a strong action. Do something immediately to show your commitment to mastering English. Buy some lessons. Hire a tutor. 
contact a native speaker, buy an English novel, do something to show yourself that you are serious. This is the year. No more excuses. No more delays. No more complaining. No more doubts. This is the year you speak English fluently. Passion is important. This week, I have a new teacher at the Casa Shilahu Spanish School. She is much better. Last week, my old teacher never smiled. She had no passion for teaching. But my new teacher smiles often. She enjoys talking. She enjoys communicating. When I talk, she looks at me. She listens. It seems like she likes her job. At Effortless English, we talk a lot about methods. Teaching methods are very important. We use the best learning methods. We use the most successful methods. We always choose methods based on independent research. So you learn easily and quickly. However, method is not the only important thing. Passion and enthusiasm are equally important. The teacher must love teaching. The teacher must have passion. The teacher must be interested in teaching. If the teacher does not have passion, the student will feel it. The student will quickly become bored and tired. The student will lose motivation. This happened to me last week. After only one week with a bored teacher, I was ready to quit the school. On the other hand, after only one day with a good teacher, I feel motivated and happy about learning Spanish. Our attitudes are very important, both as teachers and students. We must be passionate, positive, and enthusiastic. As students, we must find teachers who love teaching. We must find materials that are interesting to us. We must take care of our emotions and motivations. That's why I try to be enthusiastic and excited in my lessons. Sometimes I even shout. You feel my energy. You become more excited about English. You enjoy the stories and ideas and don't focus on grammar. This is probably the most important method of effortless English. Passion. Sigmund. Sigmund died yesterday. Uh, those of you who listen to my old podcasts will remember him. He is Kristen's cat who was diagnosed with cancer over 14 months ago. Uh, at the time, we were told that he had only three to four more months to live. But Kristen gave him alternative treatments, nutritional supplements, acupuncture, and herbs. He lived for 14 months. During that time, he got love and attention and was able to be with Kristen, with whom he has a special bond. He died yesterday in their apartment. Kristen was with him. He was a very sweet and affectionate cat. He loved to put his head on Kristen's shoulder, covering his face with her long hair and purr. Kristen has had him since he was a kitten. Very sad. So of course she is very sad now, as am I. Uh, we've been meditating and praying for him, and we have been reading the Tibetan book of Living and Dying, a wise and beautiful book about life and death. Through all of this, I am reminded that love and compassion are for all sentient beings. It's the reason I became a vegetarian, for I do not wish to contribute to the suffering of any being. I believe that animals, in fact, are wonderful teachers and companions. Their innocence and relative helplessness challenge us to expand our loving kindness to embrace all. For this I am grateful. Most of all, I am grateful for the happiness that Sigmund gave Kristen and myself. Hi everyone! I'm happy to say we are getting organized at Effortless English. 
As many of you know, my podcast and blog have had a wide variety of topics. I have talked about my personal life, about my teaching research and theories, about our lessons, about our company, and about our travels. For a while, I was also doing podcasts about idioms and slang. This was quite popular, but I haven't done them in a while. Well, Chris and I have had a lot of long conversations recently, and we decided that he would do a podcast that focuses on idioms and slang. Right now, he's doing a new slang podcast every week. He just started, but already he has one show about sports slang and one about food slang. He'll continue to do these every week. Meanwhile, my podcast will remain the official podcast of Effortless English. In other words, I'll focus on our teaching methods, research, and other related topics. I'll also continue to provide lots of spontaneous English for our members, both monologues by me and also recorded spontaneous conversations. If you're interested in learning slang, check out Chris's new podcast at www.flowenglish.libsyn.com. Enjoy! Subconscious versus conscious learning. Languages should be learned subconsciously, not consciously. The research shows that subconscious learning of English is much better than consciously studying the language. In countless studies, the result is always the same. Students who learn English subconsciously learn faster and better than students who use traditional, conscious, analytical study methods. So, what exactly are subconscious methods? And what are the traditional conscious methods? Well, you already know the old conscious way of learning English. You use your conscious brain to analyze English grammar, memorize English vocabulary, and translate English messages. This is the method you used in school. You consciously studied the mechanics of English. As if it was a car, you cut up English with your mind and then studied the parts, word by word, rule by rule. The result, as you know, is that you know a lot about English grammar rules and translations, but you can't speak well and you can't understand native speakers. Subconscious methods are more effective. These methods provide understandable English input to your brain, and then your subconscious brain does all of the rest of the work. Consciously, all you do is enjoy English stories, articles, conversations, movies, and novels. You never think about grammar rules. You never attempt to memorize words. Of course, the Effortless English system is a subconscious learning system. You learn grammar by listening to our crazy mini-stories. We carefully repeat grammar patterns during the story. But you don't think about any rules. You just listen and enjoy the story consciously. But subconsciously, your brain learns English grammar. When you learn in this way, you can actually use the grammar too. Your spoken and written English grammar will improve tremendously. And it will be stress-free. It will feel automatic. You'll just say things better and write things better, and it will feel effortless. You won't be thinking about rules at all. You must trust yourself. So many students are afraid to use subconscious methods because they don't trust their own brains. 
They are afraid to relax and enjoy English learning. They are afraid to let the learning happen naturally and effortlessly. Unfortunately, these fearful students almost never learn to speak English well. Don't be one of those students. Change your way of learning. Learn English subconsciously, and finally, speak excellent English. Success stories. I would like to say you're fantastic. Just through a few lessons, I feel more confident in speaking English. Two weeks ago, we had a party celebrating Christmas Eve, and I met two Canadians and I said hello to them. You know, they turned around and asked me, "Where did you learn to speak English?" I think that my pronunciation was the same as theirs. So they were surprised. And one more thing, I watch TV on an Australian network, and can you imagine that I was able to understand what they said? Almost all of the news about an ancient culture, and recent news about the new coach for England's football team, Capello. I am so happy and am enjoying my natural improvement. Thank you so much. God bless you. Ha Nguyen. I love success stories. Every week, we get emails from excited English learners. I really appreciate these emails. To be honest, they make me very happy, and they motivate me to keep improving. When you send me an email like this, I feel very happy. It feels good knowing that so many people are using our effortless English conversation lessons to speak. Excellent English. It's great. Congratulations to all of you. This is why I started my own English teaching company. I wanted to help enthusiastic students. I wanted to make and sell my own lessons. I wanted to encourage students to enjoy English, to improve quickly, and to feel happy. Because I'm very busy now. I sometimes don't realize how much we are helping. Your emails help me to remember. Your happy emails energize and excite me, and make me want to help more students. In the future, I will include more member emails on this blog. I try to put member comments on the Effortless English homepage, but. We get too many emails to include them all, so I'll start adding them here. If you have an English success story, email me. Tell me what you did and how you improved. If your email is great, I'll include it here on my blog. If you send a picture of yourself, I'll also include your picture. Thanks for all your great emails. Email your success stories to me at a j hog a j h o g e at effortlessenglish dot org. Put success story in the subject line. The best investment. What is the very best investment? Which investment guarantees the highest ROI, return on investment? Given the worsening economic conditions in the world, this is an extremely important question. The experts, of course, constantly change their advice. Many proclaimed that the stock market was the best investment, providing the best returns over time. They recommended diversified mutual funds as a sure bet, long-term investment. Now, the stock market has crashed, and all those people with mutual funds are in serious trouble. 
Other experts recommended real estate. Buy, 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 they said. These geniuses gave advice such as, your home is your best asset. It's not an asset at all, usually. Now, the housing market has crashed and millions of people are in trouble, as are the banks that lent them the money. At the moment, metals and commodities are looking like good investments, especially with the recent big drop in prices. Probably, these are good long-term investments at the moment. However, this is not the best investment. There is one investment which is always superior. There is one investment that always pays very high returns. This is one investment that always beats all others. What is it? Where are Tomoe and I putting most of our own extra dollars? The answer, learning, education. The best investment is always learning. Learning new skills, acquiring new knowledge, gaining new mental, physical, and emotional resources. These investments cannot be beat. When most people have extra money, what do they usually do? Well, most people buy toys and luxuries first. For example, if they get a raise at work, they promptly buy a bigger house and or a more expensive car. They also tend to buy new stereos, new TVs, and lots of other new toys. Those who are more investment-oriented, which is a small minority, will first buy investments, usually stocks of some kind. A few might buy rental real estate or another kind of standard investment. But how many people spend? There are many end first on education. There are many people, for example, who will buy a $30,000 car happily and then complain about the price of a $3,000 seminar. Yet the seminar is far more likely to enhance their business, career, and overall life than an expensive car. An expensive car is, after all, just a status symbol. Last year, Tomoe and I spent more money on education than on anything else. We attended three Tony Robbins seminars, and we enrolled in two more. We attended two language teaching workshops. We enrolled in a financial coaching program. We joined an internet marketing coaching program. We joined a life coaching program. We bought a large number of e-courses, DVD programs, and books. We also attended an entrepreneur meetup group and a web entrepreneur group. We went to Guatemala and studied Spanish intensively for a week. We took a cooking class in Mexico. We took a jewelry class in Mexico as well. And we made a couple of cool silver rings. We did this because we know that resourcefulness, knowledge, and skills are investments that always come back to us. I know, as a businessman, that what I learned last year will transform my business and increase our profits faster than any stock, real estate property, or other standard investment. In fact, I know absolutely that specific ideas and skills that I learned led to specific changes to our business, which produced measurable increases in sales and profit. I know, for example, that I paid about $3,500 for the internet marketing coaching program. Then, used what I learned in the first month to increase our monthly income by $5,000. In other words, the program paid for itself in less than a month. And now, we will continue getting that extra $5,000 every month for years and years and years. I know of no other investment that pays that kind of return. Other learning investments pay less obvious, 
but still powerful returns. For example, as a teacher, I'm always observing the methods and techniques of the teachers and leaders in any class, workshop, or seminar that I take. I always learn something from them that improves my own teaching and leading, even if it's what to avoid doing. My improved leadership skills translate into improved business for our company. This is true for you too. It's true for everyone. Invest in education first. Spend $10,000 on seminars before you spend it on a car or bigger house. Spend $500 on an audio course before you spend it on a new TV. Whether you are focused on your career as an employee or you are a business owner, there's no greater investment than your own learning. Improve your knowledge and skills. Improve your resourcefulness and emotional mastery. Improve your motivation and attitude. What you learn can never be taken away. Markets crash and everything can be lost, but skills and knowledge stay with you all of your life. Always make learning your first and most important investment. If you still have extra money after that, then invest in savings, a business, stocks, real estate, or commodities. And if you still have extra money after that, then and only then buy toys. As a final note, there's nothing wrong with toys and bigger houses. Just be sure to invest intelligently in your own learning first before you spend on anything else. The Effortless English Vision As the new Effortless English Club slowly gets started, I've been thinking a lot about my vision for its future. Just what do I hope the club will accomplish? I've been contemplating this question over and over. At first, I had the usual education answers. Make a podcast and study guide to help people learn English. But that answer never satisfied me. Of course, that's part of the answer. I do hope to make better and better podcasts and better and better learning guides. But in truth, I have a much bigger vision for the club. What I really want is to create an international community of learners founded on the principles of lifelong learning, autonomy, independence, hospitality, mutual encouragement, equality, and respect. I envision a community in which every member is both a learner and a teacher. I envision a community in which members help each other, encourage each other, support each other. I envision a community that offers mutual respect and hospitality to one another. I envision a community that encourages independent learning. I envision a community that supports curiosity, engagement, and a passion for communication. In many ways, this vision is born from my frustrations with traditional schools and education. Schools, in many cases, are actively opposed to these principles. Most schools are bastions of authority, isolation, humiliation, and boredom. Schools tend to kill passion, kill curiosity, and kill the love of learning. Schools foster an authoritarian social model in which the teacher and administrator are believed to have more power and influence than the students. My vision for the Effortless English Club was born from the many negative stories I hear from students. Many students talk about the trauma of their English classes. They tell tales of being corrected and embarrassed in front of their class. They tell stories of feeling foolish and stupid because they struggled with tests and grades. Many have deeply negative feelings about the English language as a result of their terrible school experiences. I want to change that. More than providing audio and learning guides, I hope the Effortless English Club will grow into a positive, enthusiastic, supportive community of learners. I hope members will help and encourage each other. I hope they will chat, 
trade emails, and start Skype discussion groups. I even hope they'll visit each other and offer hospitality to one another. So when one member travels to a new country, he or she will have a place to stay with other members. I envision the Effortless English Club as a positive force, a community of motivated, independent, passionate learners, dedicated to lifelong independent learning, hospitality, mutual respect, and mutual support. In short, I hope to undo the trauma and boredom caused by wretched school systems and help adults rediscover the amazing thrill of learning, connecting, and communicating. The Power of Narrow Reading and Listening Dr. Stephen Krashen is the top language learning expert in the world. He just published a new paper with Dr. Clara Lee Brown titled, What is Academic Language Proficiency? In the article, Drs. Krashen and Brown discuss the best strategies for learning academic English. Academic English is basically advanced English. It's the English you need to succeed in universities and professional jobs. Academic English is the next step after fluency. So, how do you learn academic English? What does the research show? Well, number one, narrow reading and listening. The narrow reading strategy is to read texts by one author, which helps ensure comprehension and natural repetition of vocabulary and grammar. Dr. Stephen Krashen, 2004. Many students believe that they must listen to many different speakers and read many different authors. But, in fact, this is a less successful method. Picking just one speaker or writer is much better. Why? Because speakers and writers naturally repeat many words and phrases. Each speaker has their favorite set of phrases. In speech, they naturally use these many times. By focusing on just one speaker, you will automatically get a lot of repetition of new vocabulary and grammar. In other words, you will learn English deeply. If you want to learn academic English, you should listen to a speaker who discusses advanced topics. For example, in my Level 3 lessons, you hear me discuss many academic level topics related to culture, politics, human rights, and relationships. By listening to all of the lessons, you naturally get a lot of repetition of common academic words, phrases, and grammar. You learn these deeply, but you don't need to try to memorize them. You learn deeply and automatically. You learn them effortlessly. Number two, don't study word lists or grammar rules. We acquire language and develop literacy by understanding messages, not by consciously learning about language, and not by deliberate memorization of rules of grammar and vocabulary. Dr. Stephen Krashen, 1981-2003. This is a very important point. To learn academic level English, you do not study grammar rules and you do not memorize vocabulary lists. As Dr. Krashen says, these strategies are failures. They are not successful. To learn academic level English, you must listen to and read a lot of academic English, and you must understand it. This seems simple, right? Well, the important point is that you must understand what you hear and read. How do you do that if the English is difficult? First, 
you can use interesting and fun lessons that help you understand more difficult articles and speeches. Second, you can start with easy speeches in books, then slowly find more difficult ones. Uh, for example, you start listening to easy audiobooks for children. You pick one writer speaker and listen to all of their books. Soon, these will seem easy. So, you find some books and audiobooks that are a little more difficult. You keep repeating this process, and within a year, you are reading adult novels and listening to adult audiobooks. Finally, you choose academic level books, magazines, and audiobooks that interest you, and you listen to them every day. By following these methods, you will learn academic English. You will understand advanced vocabulary and grammar. You will correctly use advanced vocabulary and grammar. And you will never again study grammar rules and vocabulary lists. Top 5 Mistakes English Learners Make What are the most common mistakes that English learners make? Which mistakes do most English learners need to correct in order to learn English much faster? Here are the top 5 English learning mistakes. 1. Focusing on grammar. This is the biggest, most common, and worst mistake. Research shows that grammar study, in fact, actually hurts English speaking ability. Why? Because English grammar is simply too complex to memorize and use logically. And real conversation is much too fast. You don't have enough time to think. Remember hundreds or thousands of grammar rules. Choose the correct one, then use it. Your logical left brain cannot do it. You must learn grammar intuitively and unconsciously like a child. You do this by hearing a lot of correct English grammar, and your brain gradually and automatically learns to use English grammar correctly. 2. Forcing speech. Both English students and teachers try to force speech before the learner is ready. The result is that most students speak English very slowly with no confidence and uh, no fluency. Forcing speech is a huge mistake. Don't force speech. Focus on listening and be patient. Speak only when you are ready to speak, when it happens easily and naturally. Until then, never force it. 3. Learning only formal textbook English Unfortunately, most English students learn only the formal English found in textbooks and schools. The problem is, Native speakers don't use that kind of English in most situations. When speaking to friends, family, or coworkers, native speakers use casual English that is full of idioms, phrasal verbs, and slang. To communicate with native speakers, you must not rely only on textbooks. You must learn casual English. 4. Trying to be perfect. Students and teachers often focus on mistakes. They worry about mistakes. They correct mistakes. They feel nervous about mistakes. They try to speak perfectly. No one, however, is perfect. Native speakers make mistakes all the time. You will too. Instead of focusing on the negative, focus on communication. Your goal is not to speak perfectly. Your goal 
is to communicate ideas, information, and feelings in a clear and understandable way. Focus on communication. Focus on the positive. You will automatically improve your mistakes in time. Five, relying on English schools. Most English learners rely totally on schools. They think the teacher and the school are responsible for their success. This is never true. You, the English learner, are always responsible. A good teacher can help, but ultimately, you must be responsible for your own learning. You must find lessons and material that are effective. You must listen and read every day. You must manage your emotions and remain motivated and energetic. You must be positive and optimistic. No teacher can make you learn. Only you can do it. While these mistakes are very common, the good news is that you can correct them. When you stop making these mistakes, you change the way you learn English. You learn faster. Your speaking improves. You enjoy learning English. Good luck. You can do it. Hello and welcome to Effortless English. Today is another spontaneous podcast, spontaneous English. And of course, spontaneous means uh, without a plan. And it's the most natural kind of speaking. It's speaking uh, without reading, without planning what you're going to say. And it's the way we speak when we have normal conversations, of course. So today I was trying to think about, you know, what should I talk about? I need a general topic at least. And I was uh, reading our Effortless English forums and noticed they had uh, some Skype discussions about being a vegetarian. Um, Sri, one of our uh, really fantastic members, who she's got so much energy and enthusiasm and motivation, she started a Skype discussion on the topic of vegetarianism. And I thought, hey, hey, why don't I talk about that? It's a good podcast topic because, um, uh, you know, some members know that I'm a vegetarian and I sometimes get comments or emails asking me about uh, when did I become a vegetarian? Why? How? So I'll quickly talk about that. How and why did I become a vegetarian? Well, I became a vegetarian about 15 years ago. And uh, it actually was not easy for me because uh, before I became a vegetarian, I used to eat lots and lots of meat. I was a carnivore. In fact, my favorite restaurant was McDonald's. And I would go to McDonald's all the time, many times every week. In fact, the uh, McDonald's employees knew my order. I would walk in and they already knew what I was going to order. They would just start typing it. Um, but then, you know, something changed. A few things changed. Um, the first thing that changed was I got a job as a security guard. This was after I graduated from university with my first degree, my first of three degrees, <laughs> uh, my undergraduate degree, which is in journalism. And uh, I graduated and could not find any good jobs, so I had a lot of bad jobs. And one of those bad jobs was a security guard at a chicken plant, this big chicken processing plant. And what that means, in fact, is it's a place where they kill the chickens. They bring in these big trucks with all these chickens, and then they put them into the factory, and the workers grab them and put them on these machines and the machines kill them and the blood goes everywhere and it's truly horrible <laughs> and I walked around this place as part of my job um, I worked on the weekends as a night guard well I only lasted two weekends after two weekends I had enough it was too much I, oh it was horrible I hated it and I saw how the uh, chickens suffered you know I could see they were in pain there's screeching and screaming and it was horrible and that made a strong impression on me and I thought hmm maybe I don't want to eat meat 
So I started trying to eat less meat. Uh, and also, I wanted to become a little more healthy because, uh, you know, I was generally healthy, but I, was, I had started running, running, uh, you know, first three miles, four miles, uh, five, six miles. Um, but, but running was very tough for me, very hard. I got very tired. I'd <sighs> breathing very heavy when I ran, and I didn't enjoy it so much. Um, so I had read that uh, actually a vegetarian diet uh, was really healthy and that uh, a lot of runners um, have a vegetarian diet and triathletes uh, have a vegetarian diet or an almost vegetarian diet. So I started trying to reduce the amount of meat that I ate, but I wasn't a vegetarian uh, until then I got a, a book called A Diet for a New America. A friend recommended it to me, a friend who was a vegetarian, in fact. And uh, the book is by John Robbins. It's an excellent book. And it's called, again, Diet for a New America. So I read this book, and it's, it's a really good book. It's, it's a book that is not trying to convince people, you know, you must be vegetarian. But it, uh, and it's, it, it just reviews a lot of the, the, the scientific... Uh, research behind vegetarian diets. It also talks a lot about the, the food industry, especially the meat industry, which is just horrible. <laughs> the factory farming industry. Um, terrible, terrible. And it talks about the environmental impact of uh, raising animals to eat them, to kill them and eat them. And the uh, environmental impact of going vegetarian. So I read this book and uh, it was a very powerful book. I was convinced. I thought, you know, this is, it's, it all makes sense. And, and I have already seen, you know, how, how the animals suffer. And I knew that cows suffer just as much or more and pigs really horrible. And I, I don't want to, you know, contribute to suffering for any being, any any sentient being, <laughs> any being with a mind and emotions and feelings, I don't want them to suffer because of me, because I want to eat something that I like. So for all these reasons, I started changing and really getting serious that I wanted to become vegetarian. And then the final straw, the final convincer for me was I read uh, Mahatma Gandhi's uh, autobiography. And he talks a lot about uh, his ex uh, experiences with being vegetarian. Of course, I you know I Mahatma Gandhi is just one of the, the 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 great human beings of of the modern era, maybe of ever, uh, a very deeply spiritual and ethical person, and uh, uh, that also affected me. And so, finally, I became a vegetarian. But after one month. I quit because it was too difficult because I really loved meat and it, I had this strong habit of eating meat and it was hard to change. So I started eating meat again. But then I started thinking that this is a principle that's important to me. I don't want animals to suffer. I want to be healthier. And so then I became vegetarian again. And then I quit again. And I did this back and forth, back and forth for almost a year until finally I completely became a vegetarian. And that was about 15 years ago. And I've been a vegetarian ever since. Something very interesting happened when I became a vegetarian related to my running. I noticed during that year when I was going back and forth, I noticed that when I was eating vegetarian, I felt great when I was running. And when I was race in these races, like a 5K race, for example, I got faster times. But when I was eating meat, I felt more tired, it was more difficult to run, and my times in the races were slower. So for me, this was a bit of empirical, kind of uh, quantitative scientific evidence that, hey, the vegetarian diet is healthier. I'm uh, in better shape, and I can run faster and longer, and I feel better when I'm vegetarian. That was probably one of the things that was the kind of big thing that, that convinced me that, you know what, this is the way to go. This is what I need to do. 
And as I said, that was 15 years ago, and I still have a lot of energy, and I still feel good, and I'm still very happy to be a vegetarian. No meat for 15 years, and I feel great. So anyway, that's my story of becoming a vegetarian. Uh, if, if you're interested in being a vegetarian, you know, I don't try to convince people. I don't try to tell people you should be vegetarian. But if someone is interested, if they ask me, then I, I do recommend John Robbins' book, uh, Diet for a New America. It's a really great introduction to being a vegetarian. Okay then, so that's my story of being a vegetarian. See you next time. Bye-bye.